Hello, my name is Dr. Robert Gish. I'm a hepatologist, professor, consultant at Stanford University. I'm working in collaboration with a team at Renown to help develop a liver service. This specific presentation is on coagulation in patients with cirrhosis, with a special focus on thromboelastography. I want to thank my collaborators for this, including Susan Cox, Denise Wiley, Dr. Tim Halterman, Dr. Craig Sandy, and all the people in the blood bank and transfusion service here at Renown who have been instrumental in getting the TAG program off the ground. Let's move forward and talk about cirrhosis, coagulation, and a paradigm of awareness in 2015. I have no relevant disclosures. Clotting process includes the initiation and formation of a platelet plug, propagation of the clot as a coagulation cascade continues, including fibrin and fibrinogen, and also potentially termination of the clotting by antithrombotic control mechanisms. That clot may eventually be removed by fibrinolytic, fibrinolytic processes. Coagulation factors. Here are some comments relevant to liver disease patients. Remember that all the coagulation factors, except von Willebrand's factor, which is in the vascular endothelium, and calcium are produced in the liver. And there's four vitamin K-dependent cofactors, two, seven, nine, and 10. Decreased vitamin K can be found in liver disease, dietary deficiency, lack of absorption, bile salts, jaundice, but sub-Q vitamin K rarely works in these patients because of the lack of synthetic enzymes, including this gamma carboxylation that takes place in patients who have prothrombin. There's decreased degradation of activated coagulation factors, and synthesis of abnormal coagulation factors are present with high levels of factor VIII, for instance, as an acute phase reactant, and you can have abnormal fibrinogen, so things are quite dysfunctional. But in the end, you may have normal coagulation. This is manifested by normal thromboelastography in patients who have an INR that could be 3, 5, or 7. So look at your patients at risk of DVT, pulmonary emboli, portal vein thrombosis, even though they're cirrhotic and appear to be anticoagulated by an INR. The INR test is really out of date in this clinical setting. This hemostatic rebalance in liver disease takes place. Many factors are looked at here in this complex graph, just emphasizing all of the pro and anticoagulation factors that are present. Increased bleeding can result in acute decompensation. Thrombosis in the portal vein, which can occur in up to 50% of cirrhotics who are followed long-term, can also result in liver injury and decompensation, and some patients have overt DIC, although this is quite rare in patients with chronic liver disease, acute on chronic, or fulminant hepatic failure. But there are special settings where you may wish to use an antifibrinolytic agent. Let's rebalance. Well, gosh, you have low platelets, but high von Willebrand factors. Impaired platelet function, but low level of what's called ADAMS-13 high production of nitric oxide and prostacyclin, but also high factor VIII levels, decreased vitamin K-dependent cofactors, but low levels of other anticoagulants, such as protein C, protein S, and antithrombin-3, vitamin K deficiency in some patients, decreased or dysfibrinogenemia with concomitant decreased levels of plasminogen. There's other factors that are involved that are listed here as well. Portal vein thrombosis, short term, 10 to 20% of patients, even in patients with a child's A. The worse the portal hypertension, the higher the risk. And you can see DVTs and pulmonary emboli in up to 5% of hospitalized patients with acute liver disease or chronic liver disease, or acute on chronic. Those patients need at least some type of lower extremity support, and at least some point in the future in a separate discussion, we'll talk about anticoagulation in patients with cirrhosis with products such as anoxaparin as in development.
Cirrhosis is also believed to be a microthrombotic disease. Parenchymal extinction, clotting, and then recanalization, recanalization, resulting in proliferation, ischemia, and eventually contributing to progression of cirrhosis. This is why one large prospective study of anoxaparin mortality rate was reduced by over 40% by anticoagulating cirrhotic patients who did not have evidence of portal vein thrombosis or clinical evidence for prothrombotic state. Can we predict bleeding risk with our current best laboratory tests? In general, the answer is no, but now I'm going to try to advance your utilization of TAG to think about how to manage these patients. But let's back up and say, let's do a paracentesis on a thousand patients, check the INR and platelet count, but do nothing. No significant procedure-related complications. So for paracentesis, the key thing is to do a bedside ultrasound, target your procedure location, but they do not need coagulation support. This is the current standard of care. What are other changes we can encounter in cirrhosis? Platelets are low because of splenic sequestration, low thrombopoietin levels, bone marrow suppression, autoantibody destruction. New platelets are much more active than old platelets, and the old platelets are cleaned out first. Platelet function is poor in uremia. Think strongly. I'll talk again about DDAVP. Uremia, there can be changes also to the blood vessel wall, phospholipid composition. Hyperfibrinolysis can take place, and it can look like DIC. TAG will show you in a moment what that looks like. Mild fibrinolysis is found in up to half of cirrhotics that can parallel the degree of liver dysfunction. Clinically evident fibrinolysis with clotting abnormalities and bleeding abnormalities can be found up into one in ten patients with cirrhosis. Ascites can trigger fibrinolytic activity. We discussed this increased thrombotic risk because of the decreased anticoagulants that are natural in our system. Patients have a pro and anticoagulant status, auto anticoagulant. Other risk factors for DDT included a low albumin and a test that we don't order in patients with cirrhosis or chronic liver disease, PTT. Surgery is a factor that can help predict risk of DDTs and downstream consequences. Interestingly, five patients had antiphospholipid antibodies in this, in this series. You can treat with low molecular weight heparin or Coumadin, but you have to make sure their varices are banded until obliteration. Caution, especially in patients that are ill and in the hospital with anticoagulation. Infection can induce or expedite clotting events as well. Treat sepsis aggressively, suspected sepsis aggressively. Talked about renal failure, you have low ADP levels in platelets, low serotonin, decreased thromboxin A2 generation, which decreases platelet activity. You have this dysfunction of glycoprotein, G, P, 2, B, and 3A. This is very important to activate platelets as decreased platelets are less functional. Platelet nitric oxide synthesis is increased. This inhibits platelet aggregation in uremia. Of course, as you worsen anemia, platelet function is decreased because there's less platelet physical interaction with the platelet, sorry, with the blood vessel wall. PTT is an intrinsic pathway and is a very poor liver function test and not advised. INR, a poor test, because it's not changing until we've lost 30, 50%, maybe 60% of liver function. Platelet count is useful, but you're not sure of platelet function. The thromboelastography is the top of the pyramid. Individual factor levels may be occasionally useful. Increased INR, as we talked about, is a vitamin K dependent issue. Depending on what altitude you're at, can change the INR. There's huge, wide interlaboratory variation. It has been validated as a prognostic marker when using combination in the MELD score. 
That's for disease, liver disease mortality, but not bleeding risk. Do you know to correct an INR in many liver patients, you may need 7 to 14 liters of fresh frozen plasma. Do not treat the INR. Treat the patient and treat the tag in combination with the patient's clinical scenario. Factor 8 can help distinguish DIC from liver failure. DIC factor 8 is consumed and is low. It's high in many patients with cirrhosis, almost acting like an acute phase reaction. Factor 5 and 7, especially factor 7, have a very short half-life and can be predictive of near-term liver dysfunction. Fibrinogen levels below 100 milligrams per deciliter are associated with decreased clot formation that go back to the tag with the alpha and K to determine the need for cryoprecipitate supplementation. Thromboelastography, the current standard of measuring coagulation status in patients with cirrhosis. We're measuring time to initial fibrin formation, clot formation, rate, clot quality and strength, and platelet function, and clot lysis. This is the machine from Hemonetics that's here at Renown, TEAG thromboelastography, measuring these four major parameters. There's a machine called Rotom, uses similar technology also, high quality data output. This is how a tag works. You have a cuff, you put in a whole blood that is then attached to a pin. The pin is dropped with a cylinder into this blood. And there's a rotational force that takes place within this heating element sensor. And information is transmitted along this torsion wire to get this type of pattern. Yes, it looks a little bit like a wine glass, or that first stem is the vitamin K developed for dependent cofactors. The angle and K have to do with fibrinogen quality, function, and finally, MA maximum amplitude platelet function. And finally, finally, out to the right is lysis. There's DIC and clot lysis taking place. This may stimulate the use of an agent that blocks fibrinolysis. Another diagram showing this a little bit more magnification, emphasizing R, alpha, MA, and finally a pattern that would suggest fibrinolysis. More examples of a tag normal, person anticoagulated or factor deficiency, C, platelet blockers, narrow MA, Fibrinolysis looks a little bit like a dreidel and hypercoagulation with a very short R and that angle increased markedly. And also a higher magnitude of MA. Hemorrhagic, you treat with clotting products, thrombotic, you're going to treat with antifibrinolytic agents, maybe platelet inhibitors, and potentially other alternatives for managing that thrombotic or hypercoagulable state. Thromboelastographic changes in early rebleeding in cirrhotic patients was suggested or supported, especially by the R and K, where the p value was statistically significant, a p value of less than 0 0.001. Also, alpha, which correlates with K, was, K was statistically significant. INR or PT, not significantly correlated with bleeding risk. We already discussed this graph saying that patients with acute liver injury, acute liver failure, thromboelastography may be minimally changed, and INR may be markedly changed. So monitor that tag. It does help you decide who may be at risk for death or need for liver transplantation. Tag guided transfusion decision making decreases intraoperative blood transfusion during, er, during liver transplantation, as published by Wang in 2010. Blood products, platelets, fresh frozen also decreased, as well as cryoprecipitate. More information plasmapheresis, platelet units, 
cryo, fresh frozen, and hair paralysis. 230 articles looked at TAG. There is increasing data in trauma patients using TAG. TAG-based algorithms are being established. Faster therapeutic decisions were identified. What products have the greatest impact on clot strength as measured by TAG? Platelet count, fibrinogen, and procoagulant factor levels, which would be supplemented by fresh frozen plasma. What interventions? This has to do with the algorithm that's been established here at Renown, moderate risk procedures, platelet count less than 20,000 and MA less than 60, high risk procedures, they look count less than 50,000, MA less than 60. Think about trolley and infection in that consent process. Fresh frozen plasma, you're going to think about in patients with a markedly prolonged R value and in patients who are actively be bleeding with a prolonged R value. Cryoprecipitate, if fibrinogen low, but more importantly, if the K is greater than 3, or angle less than 53 degrees. Here's a case of a patient who was in a water jet skiing accident. No blood products given initially. Finally, platelets were transfused after platelet mapping took place. As you can see, the green and red lines are the level of platelet inhibition in this patient. And platelet transfusions were advised here is platelet mapping using both ADP or arachidonic acid, still showing platelet dysfunction. And here is what happens after platelets were transfused. Look at the MA in the third line down, falling across the four columns. Patient admitted MA 3.3, platelets given one unit increased to 57 near normal. 316, the patient got toradol and they markedly decreased. Another unit of platelets, MA back towards normal. Very important to be tracking this and just think only two units of platelets transfused in this patient with markedly abnormal platelet function or marked platelet dysfunction identified. There are renowned treatment algorithms that are available on note cards and on the web-based system here at Renown strongly advise you to consider those. In summary, look at this wonderful clinical study with over a thousand patients, coagulation defects, INR, platelet count, no procedure-related complications took place, no blood products used. For paracentesis, use ultrasound guided, but no coagulation products, and you're within standard of care. Central venous catheters, also, quote unquote, a potential problem. No blood products, no serious bleeding complications, even with markedly abnormal INR and platelet count. Do this also under imaging as indicated. The coagulation products are not needed. One important take home message is in liver patients, never place subclavian catheters. Paracentesis and thoracentesis in a different study. PT and PTT, markedly abnormal, low platelet count, no increased bleeding in patients with mild coagulopathies. Elevated creatinine, on the other hand, did affect coagulation, did affect bleeding risk. Strongly consider DDAVP for procedures and platelets, for platelet dysfunction in patients with uremia. Central venous catheter, again, important information. It's FFP, prevent bleeding complications. 57 randomized controlled trials did not demonstrate efficacy of FFP to prevent hemorrhagic complications. Does abnormal INR predict bleeding in other invasive procedures? 25 studies. Elevated coagulation parameters provided little or no predictive value for bleeding. Interventions, we talked about cryoprecipitate using angle and K values. Common factor seven, very expensive, rarely should be used, 
consult with a hematologist to help guide. Vitamin K, advise but understand it's rarely going to help. Orally, vitamin K is not absorbed. DDAVP, very important in uremia. Maintain hematocrits about 21 to 25 to improve platelet function. For thrombin complex concentrate and recombinant factor 7A, guidelines are highlighted here. We're going to think about combining our TEG parameters to help refine this as well. Use your hematology colleagues to guide these very special, expensive therapies. Consent patients for transfusion reactions, consent for infections, consent for trolley. Remember, these blood products can result in marked volume overload. Final data here, heart failure from a European study, trolley, all this should be part of your consent process. It's not just a risk of bleeding. In conclusion, coagulation and chronic liver disease, especially cirrhotic patients, and acute liver failure is complex and a, quote, balance process where you can understand the balance through using thromboelastography. Need more information? You can get different clotting factors in individuals, including factor 5, 7, and 8. Look for sepsis, look for uremia, look for DIC, look for hyperthyrenolysis. Use TEG at Renown as part of your management algorithm in our liver disease patient. Treat the patient, manage the TEG, don't treat the INR. I want to thank the Renown group for helping set up these important CME and educational programs. Look forward to seeing you as we talk about other forms of acute and chronic liver disease. Thank you very much.